Yay, red dot. Okay, off we go. So the uh, long-awaited first installment of a uh, low-level runtime session is today. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I have uh, exactly an hour worth of stuff, but we'll see how long it takes. And um, this being the first one, people should definitely interrupt with questions uh, so that I can gauge whether I'm going too fast or too slow or whatever. So uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, I want to start by talking about the just the file structure of the low-level runtime code. Um, and the short answer right now is it's a mess. Uh, but um, one of the things that I'm going to be doing in the not too distant future is trying to, to decouple stuff. So uh, I'll show you where things are now. But if you watch the repository, you'll pretty soon see uh, a Realm subdirectory appear and things start to move into there to kind of decouple the Legion, the high-level runtime stuff from, from the low-level runtime. Um, but uh, let's see. So the main places we're going to look at today are uh, low-level.h, which is basically the interface that the low-level runtime uh, that Realm exposes up to the high-level runtime. Um, then we will talk about, let's see, we will look at, and the idea here is this is meant to be implementation agnostic as much as possible. Um, so we'll also spend some time looking at low-level impl.h, which is basically the header for the internal stuff uh, for the low-level runtime. So that's where things are actually defined in most cases. And then uh, we'll play a lot in low-level.cc, which is currently basically the kitchen sink for where uh, basically where low-level stuff gets piled until it's big enough that it has to be pulled out into its own file. Um, so those are the files we'll play with today. Uh, let's see, there's a couple others that um, the unfortunate of you will have to deal with from time to time. Um, low level GPU.h and .cc is the stuff that handles the, uh, the CUDA, uh, the GPU processors and all the CUDA goo. Um, let's see, low level DMA.h and .cc is uh, for the DMA subsystem of the low level runtime, which we won't talk at all about today but uh, I could spend at least a session on in the future. Um, uh, probably should. Uh, the other thing, I guess I'll we'll have to scroll up to find it, is activemessage.h and activemessage.cc. This is basically where all the GasNet-related stuff for sending messages between nodes um, uh, lives. And this stuff, this in particular, is going to be one of the first victims of my um, uh, moving files around into better places and trying to modularize things better. Um, so that that's probably going to be the most influx in the near future. Um, did I have any pieces? Those are the main ones. Um, so let's let's jump right in um, and go look at low level .h. So this is the interface that we expose to um, to the high level runtime, and there's basically what seven or eight. Or is that maybe maybe nine basic things that uh, basic uh, I, objects that the low level runtime exposes that the high level or you can use or or you could actually write an application directly to the low level runtime if you were uh, masochistic enough. Uh, so the um, actually there's one missing from this. So there's a bunch of forward declarations, although this is not a complete list. But basically the main things we're going to worry about are um, let me try to do it in some useful order, the, the machine object is the thing that describes what kind of machine we're running on. And so that machine will have, as part of it, it'll have processors and memories. Uh, and so Mike has talked a bunch about those in, 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 the, map, in the context of mapping. Um, if you actually want uh, logical regions, show up here in the form of index spaces, which are the index spaces, right, that, can, that names the elements in a, in a logical region. And then the idea of a region instance, which is basically a physical instance. So it'll hold some number of fields uh, for a particular index space uh, and keep track of the, the layout of it. In particular, the thing you don't see here right now is field space. Uh, field spaces only exist in a high level runtime. Uh, the fact that there are multiple instances for the same index space that have relationships with each other is entirely the, the uh, domain of the high level runtime. The low level runtime just knows about actual instances of data and and allows you to copy between them uh, so that's one of the divisions of responsibility um, the other main thing that uh, the low runtime provides is is basically an asynchronous task graph and scheduling of that 
And so the main thing that we're going to use a lot and spend most of the time today on is the event class, which is basically used to describe um, a, a time at which something interesting will have happened uh, in, in execution of our uh, asynchronous task graph. Um, there are two subclasses of event that get used in interesting ways. Uh, one is a user event. And the idea here is this is an event whose uh, where the the something interesting that's happening is actually indicated by an explicit triggering of the event by the user, uh, say the high-level runtime, uh, for example. And the other one, which is missing a forward declaration here, is uh, uh, barriers. Uh, so if you want to have a uh, collective type operations, uh, those are actually a subclass of event as well, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, uh, later on. So uh, let's see. The next thing to talk about is Pretty much all the objects that the low-level runtime uh, hands off to uh, exposes to the high level um, are exposed as um, platform or system node independent handles. The idea is that rather than exposing pointers, since we are a distributed system here, um, we can't expose uh, pointers aren't portable. So instead we have um, uh, IDs that we pass around. Um, for, for these things. So events, uh, reservations, memories, processors, index spaces, all these are actually uh, tiny structures that have one, pretty much one thing inside them. And the thing they have inside them is an ID. And so we have this low level ID type here, uh, which shows up. And so for example, if we search for, um, let me pick one that's not gonna be too crazy. Um, why am I not searching? Oh, my search window is just up there. Uh, so if we look at, say, a memory, here's, so here's the definition of memory a little bit lower down. Uh, what you'll see in general for these objects is they the only member variable they'll have is uh, an ID. Uh, actually, that's the type def. Here, here's the actual member variable. Then the other things you'll see are uh, helper stuff so that we can put these IDs in various STL structures and, and test equality. Um, you'll see a forward declaration for an implementation class, which is actually going to have all the interesting implementation of it. Uh, and then a method, basically, which is used to turn an ID into an impl. And currently, these are all here. Um, you, these will actually start to disappear because these actually aren't callable by, um, by the client, by, by the high-level runtime. Um, them being hung, being visible as part of the of the class definition uh, is just an anachronism. And so actually these will tend to start to disappear. The other thing then you'll see for each type of object is various methods that are specific to that object. Um, so for example, actually memories are fairly boring. Uh, let's go look at maybe a processor. Processors are much more interesting. So um, Again, an ID type, uh, the actual ID, comparison stuff, um, impl pointer, and then things like, um, you know, actually, where's the interesting one? So you can create a processor group, uh, but the most interesting thing you can do with the processor is you can spawn a task on it. And so this is a method on this processor object. And as we'll see, basically all these um, the methods that exist in these uh, handle objects are really just wrappers that go get the implementation for the call on to the to the implementation pointer. Um, and those will all be in low level impl.h. Um, okay, so let's see, we, well, we did memory. So but this is a general theme. Basically, we have this ID type, uh, and everything is, is, is really just a simple struct around, uh, uh, the, all these are plain old data, and all they contain is, is one, or in some cases, two or three little fields, which are just integer uh, values. So the ID type, uh, if we go back up to the top here, um, I guess it's actually been moved over into low-level config.h for the, uh, the C-friendly um, bindings. But basically, this is either a 32 or 64-bit unsigned integer um, <clears throat> so that it can be copied around and is relatively uh, space efficient. So um, next, I want to talk a little bit about the structure of these IDs. Um, and to do that, we're actually going to have to jump over into low-level impl.h, I believe. So um, in the shared level runtime, which most people play with initially, 
Um, the IDs are actually just integer, just um, basically indices into arrays. So processors are numbered one, two, three, four, five, memories are numbered one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Uh, there's actually more structure to IDs in the um, in the full low level runtime. And the main reason for that is we want to be able to to fairly quickly determine what type of something um, what type of object something is and also um, who owns it. Uh, it's an important thing we're gonna have to do in some cases. So low level input.h um, is again a disorganized pile of declarations. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to go search for, um, what are we going to search for? Let's search for class ID. So um, this is a class which isn't exposed directly, but basically this is this is a helper class which is responsible for disassembling our 32 or 64 bit IDs into the various subfields that, that, that describe the structure. Uh, and the way this works is basically they're just bit packed values. Um, so if we look at the 32-bit one, we have a nice little picture here. Uh, the the main two things we want to focus on right now is that the upper bits here. Can you see my mouse? You can. Cool. Okay. So um, the upper bits are a type field that say what type of object it is. And so unlike in the technically, we shouldn't need this, right? Uh, um, you know, we've got events and we've got processors and we've got memories. They're all using this underlying ID type. But they're all typed in the in the interface that Realm exposes, so technically people shouldn't be confusing processors with memories and stuff. But kind of for defensive programming and also for debugging help, uh, we burn a few bits. Uh, it shows here three. It's actually it's actually uh, it is four bits now. We burn a few bits, uh, the upper bits of of the uh, 32 or 64 bits, to encode the ID, basically for insanity checking, and also so that if you just see a raw ID, you can tell what type it is. And so there's 16 possible values for those four bits. They're enumerated here. I think right now we use about nine of them. Uh, so we've got a few left. Uh, but so for example, events are locks, barriers, memories, processors and processor groups, um, allocators for index space allocators, and then actual instances. So the, the top couple of bits say what kind something is. And so you'll see in a lot of places in the code, the first thing we do when we get an ID type uh, is we'll do a switch on it to see uh, what thing it actually is. Um, in some cases, we have a pretty good idea of what it will be, but we still do the switch uh, to catch uh, bugs. Uh, and those bugs can either be runtime bugs where we get something wrong, or it can actually be an application bug where since these handles are things that the application can actually manipulate directly, um, if, if it tangles things up, we'd like to catch that without uh, going into the weeds. So that's the type field. The next field down is basically the node field. So some of our bits are used to um, specify which node is the owner of an object. And so every object has a notion of, of an owner or at least a creator. And this is used to route requests uh, in a distributed environment. Uh, and so, and um, uh, so we pay for this on every single structure. Uh, in the 32-bit form, we only have support for um, node bits, uh, I guess the default is we only have support for 32 nodes. And so basically, if you're going to run more than 32 nodes, you either need to move these boundaries around, which we used to do, or you actually just switch to the 64-bit uh, encoding, which is up here. And in the 64-bit encoding, there's um, currently um, enough, there's 16 node bits so that uh, supports up to 64K nodes, which targets all the machines we're worried about right now. Um, if and when we need more, then what we'll probably do is steal from the uh, this index L bits. Uh, we'll steal a bunch of those. And so there, there's quite a bit of room for growth here uh, if we need to. Okay, so that's ID. So basically every every handle that we expose into the high-level runtime uh, is a 32 or 64-bit integer. And when those come into the low level, what we do is we pump them through this ID class, which is going to give us methods down here to pull out the type and the node and the high and low parts of the index. Uh, and whether there's a high or low part will depend a little bit on the actual types. And so we'll, we'll get into those as we um, as we cover each of the, the pieces in the, of the low-level runtime. Okay, so that was um, basically uh, the low-level.h. So it is basically declaring the various types, which are all instances, all basically contain these IDs, and they basically have wrapper methods, which we're going to go through into the actual implementations, which are defined in, in low level dot here. Um, before I go into how that works, how we map from the handles to the impuls, 
I want to back up and mention just a few kind of philosophical ideas behind how the low level is implemented. Um, these probably aren't terribly surprising, although uh, it's, um, they do show up in a lot of places and understanding why it's safe to do the things we do is useful. So um, kind of the, the main, the overarching goal is since this is a low level runtime, our goal is to you know, provide the functionality we need with as little overhead as possible. And so you'll see lots of cases where we do things in weird ways to try to minimize the overhead, for at least for the common cases. Uh, one, one thing in particular that shows up a lot is we try very hard not to take locks when we don't need to. Uh, there are lots of mutexes in the low level runtime, and we take them when we need to. But when, uh, when possible, the common paths are rigged to not have to take a lock. And uh, one of the main ways this is done is, is a general idea of uh, monotonic data structures. And the idea here is you have data structures which, for example, have pointers that can only go from a null value to a non-null value. And once they're non-null, they can never change again. Um, or counters that can only increment. And the idea behind this is that if you, you know, if you're looking for a pointer and you need it to be non-null, or if you're looking for uh, a value, you know, a, a field to have reached a particular value, it's safe to read the value without taking a lock first. And if it satisfies your criterion, you know, if the pointer is non-null or if the counter, the value is large enough, then you're good. You don't need to take the lock. You know that um, although other people may be changing that value asynchronously to your read, it can only progress monotonically. And so if it's if it's at or past the point that you're interested in, then it will never go back. And therefore, you don't need to take the lock. So you'll, you'll, the common pattern you'll see in low-level runtime code is a test to see, a, basically a test without a lock to see if the condition we want has been satisfied. If it has, that's great, we're done. If not, then we go test the lock and we go, sorry, we go take the lock and then check again to, to avoid race conditions. And if the condition we want is still not satisfied, then we will go meeting. meeting. And then we will go, um, uh, you know, do whatever we need to 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 get it to the point that we need. Uh, put push it along as necessary. But the the common pattern will be look at it first. If what if it's if it's already done if it's already to the point where we want, then we won't take a lock. Um, but uh, if it's not, then we take the lock. See if it really still isn't where we want. Uh, and and if not, then then push it along ourselves. That's a pattern you'll see a lot. And the first place you'll see that pattern is in the code that converts IDs into uh, the impl stars. So I showed you both memories and processors and pretty much, you know, events and everything all have this property that um, we expose a handle to, to application code, to high level runtime code. But, um, you know, there's going to be some data structure in the low level runtime that captures the state of that thing. And we'll want to, to work with that uh, as much as possible. And so pretty much the first thing we do whenever we go into a, a call to a function is that we'll map it to uh, the actual implementation. And so maybe what I'll do as a, as a quick example for that uh, is figure out why this is not responding to what I want. We'll go peek in lowlevel.cc real quick. Or maybe not so quick. OK, there we go. And I talked before about the, I showed you the spawn method, method on the processor. So let's go look at that. Um, no, nope, that's not the right one. Uh, there we go. Here's the right one. So, uh, other than a bunch of logging code, um, the main thing that you can see is happening in processor spawn is we're getting the implementation. So we got a processor. Uh, this was called on a processor, and we call the impl method on the processor to actually get a pointer to the implementation star, and then we just forward that task on to uh, the the processor itself. Uh, other cases you'll see where you pass other events in as well. Um, in this case here, the weight, the event gets passed through directly, but quite often if there's other uh, handles passed as arguments, we'll get the impl star for that and then pass those, those impl stars in as well. So there's an implicit assumption here that uh, the impl star for a given object, for a processor or for a memory or for an event, never ever changes. Um, and this, uh, this can get you into trouble. For example, some things, in the case of processors and memories, at least right now, that's not too big a deal. They're created at startup time, so we can just uh, build an array that's big enough to hold them all. Uh, they never have to move and life is good. 
But there's a bunch of other objects that are created dynamically. Uh, instances, um, you know, we create some, but in particular events, we create lots and lots and lots of. And so, uh, although the original version of the code did basically create one big, one big statically allocated array at, at startup time and and put all the events in it so that their pointers would never move, um, this uh, clearly didn't scale well. Uh, and so we have the problem of basically how do we implement a dynamically sized data structure that has the property that the individual elements don't ever move, and also has the property that lookups generally don't need to take locks. Um, and the answer is um, in low level impl.h, there is a implementation of what I believe, if I can remember right, is called a dynamic, dynamic table. Um, so, so the idea of a dynamic table um is and it's a templated widget so it's templated on what kind of thing it's holding but the idea of a dynamic table is it's something that's going to give us a way to given an index so say an id um go find the corresponding entry go find the corresponding element so it's it's, it's templated on an index type which will generally be an id an element type which will generally be you know an impulse star and then a, I think the LT is the, maybe a lock type. I'm not actually sure we use that right now. Um, it looks like we're currently hard coded for a particular kind of lock, but uh, at least we're using the index type and the element type. So the idea is this, this is a widget. Uh, this is a piece of functionality. that's going to basically handle the problem of how do we look up a particular index into a dynamically sized data structure where the elements themselves don't ever move. And for bonus points, we're also going to want to take advantage of the fact that most of our objects tend to be relatively small. So we want to try to avoid a level of indirection and allocate them in chunks rather than one at a time. Basically, we don't want every single event implementation to be its own dynamically allocated object. Um, we're trying to, to not make the, uh, the malloc subsystem um, that unhappy. So uh, let's look at how this works. Um, and you know, in a perfect world, nobody should have to play with this, but um, it'll it'll help kind of explain uh, why why you never want an impulse star to move, and and be an example of the of some of the philosophy behind it. So let's go look at this uh, lookup entry uh, method. Uh, so dynamic table. So let's look for dynamic table uh, allocator lookup entry. Okay, so the way this dynamic table is built is basically as a tree. Uh, and think of it as a radix tree. Each level of the tree is going to correspond to some bits of, of the ID. Um, the allocator, um, we, can, we can specify this on a per uh, table basis, but basically we specify how many bits, uh, how many leaf bits are there, so how many actual objects are stored in each leaf cell of the tree. So kind of think B trees here rather than. Um, uh, individual elements uh, being in the leaves of the tree. Uh, and then so if, say, there's 10 leaf bits, that means that each block at the, we allocated the leaf can hold a 1,000 of, of whatever it is we're holding. But if that's not enough, then we're going to have to add uh, levels, basically, as the, ID, uh, as the IDs have non-zero bits uh, above that point, we start adding levels of the tree. And those come in units of this inner bits here. So, for example, we might we might have ten leaf bits, um, but then you know six or eight or something inner bits, um, and that will be the branching factor of the intermediate nodes. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out how many levels of the tree do we need to to address the thing. And what we're so what we do here is we take our index and we basically look at um, you know how many how many basically how many if how many total elements could be addressed just with one leaf block. If that's good enough, then we're done. And if it's not, then we keep adding levels of the tree uh, conceptually to um, to basically be able to store an ID large enough to, to hold the one that we're looking for. So once we know how many levels of the tree we're expecting to find, uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to get the root point of our tree. And again, without a lock here, we're going to look at the level of that root. Um, 
And the cases we're worried about here are if the tree is completely empty, or if the root of the tree uh, is the root of, is the root of a tree that isn't deep enough to hold what we want. And and the issue here is that in both cases it means that the root of our tree simply can't address um, uh, as much as we need. So I'm going to skip over that first. So that, that's the exceptional case. So I'm actually going to skip over that case first um, and get to here where we say um, if we get once we get here, basically the level we need is supported by the tree either the tree is exactly that depth or the tree is even taller um, and as another sanity check we're also double checking that um, the range of ids supported by this particular subset of the tree uh, holds the index we want uh, and then what we do is just a straight up tree walk while we're not at the leaf path uh, we must be at an inner node so get a pointer to that inner node pull out the bits uh, from our ID that are covered by this level of the radix tree and look up that child element. Uh, now two things can happen here. Uh, either that child element can be null, we can be touching a part of the tree that hasn't existed before, or it can be non-null. And again, the, the null case is the exceptional case, so let's actually look at the, uh, the common case first. And again, we haven't taken any locks here. right? If the pointer is, is non-null, then we're just going to traverse it. We're going to set end to that child and come back around this loop again. And so as long as we're following a path where the tree was deep enough to start with and the path we want in the tree has been populated already, there are no locks. We'll eventually get down to a leaf cell and right uh, and, and return that leaf cell uh, w without having taken any locks at all. And because of this tree structure, the individual blocks of leaf cells are never reallocated which means I can I can hand a I can safely hand a pointer to an element of this leaf cell back to the caller, uh, and they can hold that pointer wherever they want. It'll never change, even if more elements are allocated. So uh, let's go back up and look at the exceptional cases, uh, and let's do them. Um, uh, let's do the simple one first, which is let's say we already our our tree was tall enough. We just happened to take a path that didn't exist, and so in this case here, we try to follow a child. Uh, in the path and it is null. So uh, our, our easy out case failed and now we may need to populate the tree. So the first thing we're going to do is we're now gonna bite the bullet and we're gonna take a mutex. We're gonna take a lock on that inner node. So it's just this piece of the tree, not the whole tree. And we're gonna check again. Now that we're gonna check, now that we've got the lock, we'll check again, is that thing really still null? If it's not, well, you know, life, things worked out. Um, somebody else did the work for us and we've got a child pointer that we can use and we can just let go of the lock. If we, if it's still null, now it's null and we have the lock, so now it really is our job to allocate a new child node. Uh, and so we do that by just allocating a new child node. We figure out what level is it going to be at, which pieces of the index space uh, of the, of the uh, ID range does it own, and we call new tree node to allocate a new node and we put it in. Uh, that will be our child that we're going to continue our walk and we let go of the lock so anybody else who is also trying to traverse that path will now succeed in taking the lock and see that that we have uh, done the work for them and, and then they'll be able to continue on so this is the model of do a check uh the check if it succeeds right if child is non-null then you're good you don't it can never become null so you don't need to there's no race condition there and you can continue on if you don't get the answer you want, you take the lock and you ask again. And if the answer has become what you want, right? If, if the pointer has become non-null, well then somebody else, there was a race condition, but uh, the, the guy who won the race did all the work for you, so you get to continue on. And uh, in the uh, third case where you take the lock and either there's a race that you won or nobody else was gonna do the work anyway, you go do the work and, and continue on. So, so that's one instance of this happening here with the inner node. The other case that shows up is when the tree itself isn't deep enough. Either it doesn't exist at all, or it doesn't have enough levels to support what we want. And so this is a case here where the tree needs to get deeper, which means the root pointer is going to have to change. And so we're the same model again, right? We, we only get in here if we don't think it's high enough. So the first thing we're going to do is take the lock and check again. Um, if we 
the, if the tree still doesn't exist, well, then we'll go ahead and build the tree as many levels as we need uh, from scratch. There, there, was no, there was no tree at all. Nobody else is doing it because we hold the lock and the pointer, pointer was still null. So we'll put the pointer at what we want. Um, we haven't let go of the lock yet. It's fine if somebody else reads this root pointer before we let go of the lock because, again, it, it will only monotonically grow in height. And so they don't have to take a lock even though we're busy modifying root. They'll either see it before we write it and get a null and try to take and come through this path, or they'll see it after we wrote it and get a non-null and, and go around. Um, if the tree does exist, uh, but just isn't tall enough, well then basically we stack new nodes on top of it uh, until it's tall enough. So while the level isn't high enough, keep putting one node on top of it. And in each case, this, inter this, new, inter this new inner node will have exactly one child, which was the whole tree before uh, on the zeroth element, because we always grow uh, from, from above. But so the same, the same philosophy, basically test without a lock, then take the lock, test again, and if we still have to do the work, then go ahead and do the work. Otherwise, otherwise go through. But in in many in most cases, um, locks will not need to be taken at all, and, and life will be good. So, like I said, this whole dynamic table thing is templated to allow for um, basically populating this tree uh, and having the leaves of the tree be whatever you want. They can be you know event impulse or processor impulse or or barrier impulse or or whatever. Uh, and so for anything that can be dynamically allocated, you'll see one of these dynamic tables. Um, actually, processors and memories are a bad example right now because currently, currently they are not dynamic, but for resiliency reasons, they'll become dynamic in the not too distant future. And so you'll see processors and memories also switching over to use this dynamic table object. Um, yeah, let me pause for a moment and see if anybody has questions on this. Um, if not, then we'll we'll go into events as the first actual uh, object type that we dig in. Okay, no questions. Does that mean I'm going too fast, or does it mean I'm going too slow and it's obvious, or what? Any votes? You can vote verbally or on the little texting thing in LA. Everybody has to vote though. Too fast, too slow? Everybody asleep? Okay, well, with a vote of, actually, Elliot will vote. Uh, Carlos says right pace. Okay, excellent. And if Carlos is the only voter, then he wins. Awesome, okay, off we go. So let's talk now uh, in a little bit more detail about events, since they're kind of the glue that holds everything together uh, in the low over runtime. Uh, and so to do that, we're going to go back first to lowlevel.h and look at the kinds of events that are exposed to uh, to the high-level runtime. And so there's a, a, a small class hierarchy here. Um, so let's go find, uh, why is this not working? Because I pressed the wrong button again. Okay, so let's go find events. Um, so the events are the the root of the hierarchy, um, and you'll see events are actually a little bit special uh, because in addition to the ID type they have, they actually the handle contains another unsigned value um, called the generation, and we'll talk about how this gets this gets used in two different ways for the different kinds of, of uh, subclasses of, of event. So we'll talk about both of those. But so the event handle is actually bigger than most other handles. Um, and they contain both an ID and, and some other bits. Um, they still have the comparator objects and they still have the idea of getting an impl. Um, and so if I have an event, like I said, an event is, is, the, is a, a, way of, a way of talking about a particular thing that you want to happen or basically the, the point in time after which the thing you wanted to have happen has happened. And so events in particular, all that you can do on them is ask, are you done yet? Um, and these are the generic for form where how events get done uh, is, is basically what we're going to specialize on. But the, the thing that all events have in common is the ability to ask, are you done yet? Or the ability to, to wait on uh, them being done. And so um, I guess there's an exist method. Um, 
quite often you'll see things returning no event. Um, and so basically, if there, if, if there isn't any action required for something, then we'll return no event. And kind of by definition, the no event event has always completed. It happened at the beginning of time. And so any time when we say, oh, yeah, you have to wait for no event, it, it basically means everything, it has already happened. Uh, it, it's, it's totally fine to call any of these methods on no event uh, in particular. Uh, that, that won't cause a crash. That will actually cause a, a fast early out. So it's a good thing. Okay, so the main things we can do with an event is we can ask, have you triggered? Um, the other thing you can do, um, and so again, this, this also satisfies the same monotonic property we talked about before, right? There can be race conditions with triggering, uh, and you can, you might ask, has it triggered? We say no, but by the time we, you got back the answer, no, it may have already triggered. So you always have to worry about this answer being stale, but it can only be stale in the direction of we said no. And, and in fact, it actually has to come around and triggered. Um, you can explicitly wait on an event. We try to discourage this um, uh, greatly because it basically means you're consuming processor resources while you're waiting for this thing to happen. Um, external wait is a slightly different version where it's basically some other thread outside of Legion that's waiting. Uh, so for example, we use this for our MPI interop, interop. If the MPI thread wants to wait on an event, it can call this one. Um, and basically this is always a, a pthread uh, condition variable wait. Um, the other thing you can do with events, if there's a handful of events you want to wait on, you can merge them and get a new event that will only trigger once all of the input events have triggered. And so you can either do this, you can have a whole set of events, or if you have a small number and you don't want to go to the trouble of building an SCL data structure, then you can pass up to six of them uh, directly in this version. So actually, the funny thing is the main thing you're supposed to do with events uh, isn't actually a method of event. Uh, the main thing you're supposed to do with events is actually pass them as preconditions to other things. Uh, and so let me, uh, again, let's go back to uh, processor again. So down here was that spawn method. And so the main way you actually uh, use events is you pass them as preconditions to other actions. So if I want to spawn a task, I can pass as a, as a parameter the wait on, uh, a wait on event and uh, what you're saying is I want the I want to spawn a task, but I don't want it to start until some event that I pass has completed. And as you can see, the default, if you don't specify one, is no event. And so that means since that has the no event has always triggered, basically it means go ahead and run this task right away. But if you've got some other event and you want you don't want to wait on it personally, but you want to have this operation wait on it, well then you pass it as a precondition to the the operation rather than waiting on it yourself and only spawning the operation once you once you see that the event is waited, uh, once you see the event is triggered. So the usual model is that all operations in the little runtime are deferred. Um, they, they will return an event saying when, basically uh, as a, as a uh, description of uh, a way of waiting, as a way of talking about when the operation you're asking for is complete. And in turn, they can take a precondition that says what other um, event, you know, what other activity or, or set of activities um, that has already been kicked off need to finish before this operation should uh, should complete. Okay, so um, like I said, so this is the most common way that events are created is is automatically by the runtime as part of as a way of describing when some deferred operation is going to complete. And so, particularly if you just get an event. Like, like I showed you before, all you can do is wait on it or pass it on to somebody else as something they should they should wait on in turn. You can't uh, trigger an event directly. Um, if you get a raw event object, then it came out of the little runtime, and the runtime is going to basically trigger that event at the appropriate time. However, there are other kinds of subclasses of events that um, that the application can trigger in one way or another. And so the first one of those is a user event. And user event, uh, from the application perspective, looks just like a normal event, and there's no new value for it. The only thing we've added is a new method, which allows the runtime, sorry, allows the application to explicitly trigger it. So basically, you've got some sort of action that you want to track uh, that you're gonna, you're gonna perform on your side, 
but you still want to be able to defer other operations based on it. You can create a user event using create user event, and you get back this user event object. And so a user event is an event in every way, which means you can give it to other operations for them to wait on it uh, before they start. But also you have the ability, since you have it as a user event, you have the ability to um, specify when that, op when that uh, event actually occurs. And you can either trigger it immediately by passing uh, you know, no precondition. Or the other thing you can do is you can actually say, okay, um, I want this to trigger, but it's still only on some with some other precondition. So one way this gets used a lot, as, as Mike has shown in the high level, is conceptually Mike will have some notion of when a task is done. And he'll want to have other things that are contingent on when that task is done. And so what he'll do is he'll create a user event for task complete. Um, and that user event can be given as an event to anybody that takes events. And so subsequent operations can, can uh, be deferred based on that task being complete. But the reason Mike uses a user event instead of, say, the raw event that came back from a spawn is he may have some cleanup stuff to do, and the amount of cleanup he has to do may be somewhat dependent uh, on other things on high-level runtime. So instead, what he'll do is he'll create a user event, um, give that to other things to defer on, and then once he finally knows what collection of low-level events, what collection of operations actually need to be done for that task to be considered complete from a high-level runtime perspective, he'll use the merge event call to create a low-level event that describes when all those actual operations are completing, and he'll use that as a precondition for the triggering of the user event. And so he, the user event is basically a placeholder. The main way it get, gets used is a placeholder for a collection of, of operations that uh, you didn't know the full set of uh, um, before you started. That was maybe a long-winded way of saying it, but um, at least that's the common use case in the, in the high-level runtime. So that's that's one of the two subclasses of event is basically an event where the creator of the event is actually in charge of uh, of deciding when it's actually triggered. The other subclass of an event is the barrier, and so this is this is a uh, basically a collective operation. The idea here is that this is an event where it's not one arrive one thing that's triggering it, but you're expecting some number of things to all contribute to the completion of this event. Um, it's not precisely the same as an MPI barrier uh, because it still has the event semantics in the sense that um, you, can, you can ask if the barrier has been triggered without being one of the people that's contributing to the barrier trigger yourself. So it's sort of a, a um, a, a, a split barrier. Uh, you have you have people that are arriving at the barrier, and when enough of them arrive, the barrier is considered to have triggered. And then you have people that can check to see if the barrier has triggered and make operations contingent on the barrier triggering. And those can either be people who themselves have arrived at the barrier, or it can be people who who haven't arrived at the barrier. Uh, and so this gets used for a number of different things. Um, but in particular, if you actually want to do a, a collective operation, um, those, those turn into barriers. Uh, one other way in which barriers are a little bit special, actually there's two other ways in which they're special. One is that um, um, a barrier is reusable. So when you create a barrier, you say how many people are going to arrive at it, and you can have as many phases or, or perhaps generations of that barrier as you want. Uh, and so, um, and you can talk about uh, arriving at any particular phase of the barrier, um, and you can talk about asking if any particular phase of the barrier has actually completed yet. Um, phase the barrier phases will always complete in order, but arrivals don't necessarily have have to happen in order. It's totally fine to arrive at you know the second generation of a barrier before the first generation of the barrier has has completed. And if you think about it, this is kind of um, implied in in the property that people can arrive people can arrive at a barrier without waiting on it, right? If you're going to arrive at the second barrier, second generation of the barrier, and you're one of the people that was going to wait on the first generation, well, how can you possibly know when it's safe to to arrive on the second one? 
Uh, and so this is one of the reasons why I say barriers and, and events contain this generation thing, uh, generation field. It's so that using a barrier object, you can actually talk about subsequent versions of of the barrier and arrive at them and, and test them, even if the previous uh, gener previous phase hasn't um, hasn't uh, triggered yet. Um, for events, it's actually the other way around. You want to be able to talk about past versions of events in a in a safe way, uh, and that's why events have generations. So the other thing that that barriers can do, uh, which is a little bit non-standard for people that are used to barriers and other um, um, uh, program models is the number of arrivers at a barrier can actually be changed. So in particular, when you create a barrier, you say how many people you expect to arrive at it. And this is the baseline number of arrivals that are needed for every, genera for every um, generation, every phase of the barrier. You always have to get at least that many. But the other thing you can do is you can, for a given phase of the barrier, you can actually alter the arrival count. You can say, guess what, for this uh, phase of the barrier, uh, you need to wait for a couple more people to show up. And the main reason for this is you want to support basically a hierarchical model where conceptually you've got one task that wants to arrive at a barrier, but if it decides that it wants to split its job up into three or four subtasks, um, how do you have the barrier wait until all the subtasks are complete? Uh, one way to do it would be to have the the original task explicitly wait on all the subtasks to complete so that it knows when it's safe to arrive at the barrier. Uh, another way to do it though is actually just modify the barrier count and say, guess what barrier? Um, a few more people are gonna show up and, and you need to wait for that to, um, wait for them to show up as well before the barrier is considered to have triggered. Um, if you want to do this, there's a very, very important um, invariance you have to maintain, uh, and it's to avoid race conditions. And the invariant is that basically the only people that are allowed to call alter arrival count, the only people that are allowed to uh, say that there are more people showing up to the party are people who are already basically representing one of the pending arrivals. Uh, if you think about it, there's a race condition uh, otherwise. So let, let's say I've got a barrier with, with that's expecting four arrivals. And so that conceptually, there are four operations somewhere in the system that are each going to arrive at that barrier. When they all get there, the barrier is going to consider, be considered to be completed. If a fifth operation decides that it wants to add um, somebody to the barrier, well, there's a race condition. If it doesn't do it before the first people arrived, then it's too late. The barrier will have already triggered, and there's no way to untrigger a barrier. Right? This is one of those monotonic uh, data structures. And so, basically, the only the only uh, op the only operations that are allowed to alter the arrival count uh, are those that are still going to arrive at the barrier themselves uh, somewhere in their code path. Um, and there's no way to enforce this explicitly in the interface. It's basically, uh, if you don't maintain this invariant, then, um, well, then you'll get asserts when we notice that you're trying to arrive at a, at a phase of the barrier that, uh, sorry, that you're trying to adjust the arrival count on a barrier that has already triggered. Uh, there's one other issue uh, with this that comes up, which is um, there's also technically a race condition between um, in, in a distributed setting, uh, let's say you've got three nodes. Node one is the basically the owner of a barrier. Node two is going to arrive at the barrier, but it also decides that it's going to send some work to node three um, that's also going to contribute to that barrier. So what's going to happen is node two is going to send a message to node one saying, hey, expect one more person at this barrier. Then node two is going to send a message to node three saying, hey, do this work, and when you're done, go ahead and arrive at the barrier. Uh, node three, once it completes the work, will we'll send a message directly to node one saying it has arrived at the barrier. And now the problem is, what if that message gets to node one faster than node two's message? Um, in most cases, you know, this is gonna be a rare circumstance. You shouldn't have messages get hung up in the network for that long, but it can and will happen. And so actually what happens is you'll see barriers have one extra field on them. They have this timestamp field. And basically the way to do it, the way what this does is this maintains a dependency 
so that the barrier that node two sends to node three actually has this extra tag on it so that node one, when it gets it, it knows that uh, it's not safe to consider that barrier arrival until it gets the update from node two telling it that this, this barrier arrival was expected. Um, a little bit wonky, but basically as long as you take the barrier that comes out of alter arrival count, when you call alter arrival count, you actually get a modified version of the barrier, which basically has modified this timestamp. As long as that's what you pass to all the people, uh, all the additional arrivers, uh, then the runtime will, will take care of things. Okay. Um, I actually spent longer than I expected on the high level, or on sorry, or, well, the high level from the low level perspective, the external interface of events and user events and, and barriers. I think what I'll do is I'll show briefly uh, the corresponding structure, the corresponding implementations, and then we'll save the guts for how those implementations get used and and what um, what things you have to watch out for. We'll save that for uh, for the next iteration. So with the couple minutes left, um, we're going to hop back out to low-level impl.h. And so again, this is the header file. So this header file is included by all the low-level implementation code, but is, is not exposed to the, uh, the high-level runtime. So, so the idea here is to, um, to hide the guts of what's going on. And, and the other thing is, right, these are all using the raw uh, actual object pointers, so they're not safe to, to pass around in a distributed system. So anyway, uh, as you saw, events, just like everything else, uh, have this impl method, um, and it returns an impl star. So let's go find uh, the impl uh, event impl. And so this is the, um, basically every event can get turned into an event impl uh, via our lookups. And, Right, the event object is basically just a proxy for it. So what you should expect is on every impl to see roughly uh, one for every method that's on the external interface, you should see a corresponding one here. And so since an event had three methods, well, the event had basically two methods. It had has triggered and it had wait. Uh, I guess I've actually recently unified wait and external wait to just use one call uh, in inside the low level. But basically, so you have the two operations. You have has triggered, and you have external weight. And then the one other thing you have here is to support the idea of deferred operations, you have this very, very important add waiter call. So this is the way, as you'll see uh, next time we talk, pretty much every low level operation that's deferred on an event will use this add waiter thing to, to connect up the dots. We don't ever really wanna call, X, we, has triggered, doesn't help us because you'd have to spin on an event being ready. And wait is especially bad because then you're blocking on the event being ready. So the way you you queue yourself up for doing something once the event has triggered is is with this add waiter call. But in particular, the other thing to note is event impl also has no way of triggering it, right? The if all I have is an event impl in the low level runtime, then all I have is some description of some action that's going to happen later on. But well, there's different kinds of things it can be, and so the only thing that you have if you just know it's an event. Uh, is the ability to wait on it or, or queue yourself up for when it completes. So just like in the, in the external interface, uh, events could either be um, run to, you know, low level runtime generated internal events, or they could be user events, or they could be barriers. We'll have this same notion that an event impl captures all those things, and so all you can do is wait on it. Um, the, there will be two subclasses of event impl that cover the two different kinds of um, uh, actual things that an event impl can be describing. Um, there is the generational event impl, uh, and this is actually used to just cover both events that are going to be triggered internally by, um, by the runtime, but also user events. Um, since the only difference between those is who triggers it, um, we rely on the fact that the ex the actual trigger method available in the interface is only exposed in user event. Uh, the gen event impl um, basically um, covers both those cases, and so in particular, it has a trigger method, which we'll talk about again, I guess, next time. Uh, and so this inherits from event impl, so it has the ability to wait. You know, ask has it done been done yet? 
It also has the ability to actually trigger it. And whether this trigger comes from internal runtime code, low-level runtime code, or whether it comes from a user event trigger method call, uh, depends on which event type it is. So there's event impulse, and then the other thing is there's barrier impulse. And so this is the implementation of, of barrier objects. Uh, and so again, they have the ability to, to ask if they're triggered and wait on them or add waiters, but then they'll also support the necessary methods that you can call on the interface barrier object uh, to adjust the arrival count to, to say that you're triggering on it and also uh, for to get the data result for a collective. And so um, I guess the last thing I want to add is event impulse. So the gen event impulse has one set of methods and its own internal data structure that tracks its state. The barrier impulse as it has different set of methods and a different set of internal state. And so, although we tend to look up events just with an event uh, ID, there's actually two different kinds of implementation, whether it's a gener generational event or whether it's a barrier. And so this is where the ID field on our IDs uh, helps us. Basically, you can call, you can pass an event into the little runtime and we'll be able to use the ID, the upper bits of the ID, to determine whether it's a generational event or whether it's a barrier and go look it up in the correct dynamic table. And so let me show that and then we'll stop for the day. Uh, so that's going to be in lowlevel.cc. Let's go find the implementation of event colon colon impl. Uh, yay for levels of indirection. So basically, if I have an event and I want to get the event impulse star, I call the impulse method on it, and it turns around and actually just delegates that to the runtime object. So I actually have to go find runtime get event impulse. Runtime get event impulse. And one thing to note is this runtime object is not the same as the high level runtime object. Uh, we make probably excessive use of namespaces here. So everything you see here is inside the low level namespace and morph to the realm namespace. But in particular, the object you see here is very, very different from the high level runtime object. Okay, but here's get event impulse. So it gets an event uh, uh, handle. And so this is, you can see what we do is just get, we take that event handle and we put it into this ID class, which is going to give us the ability to chop it up into pieces. And in particular, we're going to ask what type is it? If it's actually an event, uh, then we're going to go look it up in the generational event table. Barrier, we're going to go look it up in the barrier table. And if it's neither of those, we're going to barf. Um, and um, so this is this is that defensive program, both the defensive case here of if if somebody either us or above us get handles up handles so that things aren't what we think we'll catch that here. But also this is a case where we actually need to know which table to look it up in, and we use IDs for that. Um, here's get gen event impl, and as you can see, this is basically just turn around and using that lookup entry function that we were talking looked at earlier to find a gen event impl in the corresponding uh, table. So uh, we are just about out of time. We have a minute or two for questions if folks want, and uh, I will pick up next time, whenever my next time is, with uh, showing how generational events uh, are actually implemented inside the level runtime. Because like I said, they are the glue that holds everything together. So any questions, or should we call it a day? Going once, twice, sold. See you next time.